Welcome to our panel uh, uh, that we will have today to accompany the Purdue um, Engineering uh, Distinguished Lecture Series. Um, um, I'll simply introduce our moderator for our panel, uh, uh, Dr. Bill Clark, who is alumnus of our School of Chemical Engineering, also uh, MD from uh, Indiana University Medical School, and has spent his career in medicine and, and uh, nephrology and medical devices, including a distinguished career at two uh, medical device companies. So uh, without further ado, uh, let me uh, hand the floor to Bill to introduce the panel. Thank you very much, Dr. Kim, and uh, welcome everyone to the panel discussion after such a stellar uh, lecture by Dr. Anseth. We'll focus the, the topic now to uh, precision medicine and how biomaterial development uh, kind of fits, fits into that context. The agenda is, is shown here very briefly. Uh, I will uh, give a, a very short overview of preci precision medicine, what exactly it is, and, and how uh, biomaterials uh, play into that. We'll have um, an initial introduction uh, of the panel members and then more formal introductions before each of their uh, short presentations. And then finally, uh, we'll have a, a period of at least 30 minutes, uh, hopefully, of uh, questions and answers and, and general discussion. And by the way, we, uh, we do have an absolutely hard stop at 5.15 because Dr. Anseth needs to uh, head back to Indianapolis to the airport. So we will have to abide by that uh, very, very carefully. So this, again, is just the brief introduction. Uh, Dr. Anseth, after the, the uh, very nice introduction by the dean, uh, I think you, you know her qualifications. And again, after such a stellar lecture, I think we all have a keen appreciation of how accomplished her academic career has been. And our other panelists, uh, first of all, Dr. Liu and Dr. Solorio will provide uh, fa faculty uh, research lab perspectives on uh, the role of precision medicine in terms of what they do. Uh, Dr. Brightman will provide a bioethics perspective. And finally, Dr. Hiles will, will provide uh, an industry perspective. So first of all, uh, personalized or precision medicine defined. Uh, it's, there's no, no uh, absolutely agreed upon definition, but one take is the, the combination uh, of clinical practice, at least how it's established by existing clinical data that have been generated from clinical trials involving large number of patients, and taking that information in combination with newer molecular-based ba uh, data combining that all together and uh, providing more specified and specific therapies uh, to patients. This uh, approach has been already widely used in the pharmaceutical uh, industry, and as you can see, there, there's a, a sense that uh, the pharmaceutical industry will even adopt this approach uh, more broadly in the future. The components of precision medicine essentially touch uh, most aspects of the clinical care of patients. Everything, for example, uh, uh, as, as a, just one example, risk assessment in uh, a patient who, for instance, has uh, a family history of some type of genetic disorder. Uh, broadening the scale a little bit, it, it can be applied to, on a larger population, uh, detection uh, of a certain disease uh, in a high-risk population. And then finally, uh, firming up the diagnosis in a specific patient, providing a treatment plan, and then importantly, uh, ensuring and follow-up that uh, a certain outcome has been achieved and that outcome uh, is a durable and, and robust one. So there was an absolutely uh, fascinating position paper that was written by Dr. Anseth and colleagues, so it's very timely that we're discussing this issue and that she's uh, involved in our panel discussion. So the general idea here is, again, is how do we take, uh, whether it's a, a drug or a medical device or a biomaterial that has been clinically qualified in a, a, a sometimes a clinical trial that involves hundreds or even thousands uh, of patients that, uh, that obviously have significant biologic uh, variability and heterogeneity, how do you take uh, that particular biomaterial device and customize it so that it's actually 
uh, very appropriate and specific in a given patient. So that's the challenge that Dr. Anseth and colleagues tried to address in this paper. And essentially, it was kind of a call to action uh, to, to engineers to start thinking about how precision medical pr medicine principles should be applied in the further development of biomaterials. So the previous figure and the next two figures are, are drawn uh, directly from, from the paper. These are just uh, four examples uh, of how uh, this principle uh, of applying precision medicine uh, ideas to development of biomaterials may play out. First of all, uh, material chemistry, and by the way, going from left to right, is going from more general to more customized. So the, on the, the, the approach on the left uh, for material chemistry is just a, a relatively nonspecific diffusion of a drug out of a, some type of polymer matrix all the way to the, uh, to the right. The most customized approach uh, would be a, a system that reacts to a, a patient-specific enzyme. Another example in terms of fabrication would be uh, a more customized approach would be a, a 3D printed, for instance, organ. And then even further customized would, would be allowing for that organ to kind of grow as uh, the patient uh, evolves in, in his or her clinical disorder. Thirdly, uh, bioactive components uh, in the transplant world an allogeneic uh, transplant, even though it may be, so to speak, well-matched, there are still some difficulties that may result uh, in, once, the, once the transplant is done. Autologous transplants of patients' own cells uh, uh, would, would, would be an improvement. And then even further and more customized would be an approach uh, in which the cells that are being transplanted actually would be adapted so that they would behave in a certain way in the milieu in which they're going to live uh, in, 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 the, in the newly transplanted environment. And finally, uh, we, we all have heard uh, much about big data and the application of that uh, to, to medicine. And certainly precision medicine uh, plays a role there. It's anticipated to do so in the future. And again, these are examples of going from fairly general on the left to much more specific and customized on the right, where an in situ approach uh, uh, of some type of data tracking system could provide real time uh, evidence and data uh, in the progression of a disease or maybe the monitoring uh, of, of some type of intervention in terms of the patient's response. So with that very brief overview, uh, as I mentioned, we'll, we'll have two uh, faculty members who are laboratory researchers who will provide their perspectives on, uh, on how precision medicine may apply uh, to what they do. Uh, the first uh, laboratory researcher is a colleague of mine from uh, chemical engineering. Dr. Julie Liu is an associate professor of chemical engineering and, and also biomedical engineering by courtesy. Um, her laboratory is focused on biomaterials, particularly as they apply to musculoskeletal disorders and, and surgical applications. Uh, so I will hand it over to Dr. Liu. Um, I really just wanted to show you two, two examples from our laboratory on some problems that we're working on and how the personalized aspect could be applied to this, um, to these two projects. So the first is actually work um, by Chang Yu Lin, who's in the audience and is defending next week. Um, he's been working on designing these redox responsive hydrogels. And the idea is this is actually a very similar polymer to what uh, Christy talked about. So it's a PEG polymer. These have the thiol groups. Um, and what he had done is he wanted to make a one-pot reaction where you can have um, both uh, reducible bond shown in gold and then the non-reducible bond shown in red. The idea was um, often, if you're using this thiol chemistry, if you get increased mechanical properties, you can't really decouple that from how they degrade. And so he wanted to combine um, both the non so basically the permanent and the temporary bonds. And he was able to get um, gels that had the same stiffness, but you could tune the degradation rate based on how many of the reducible bonds you have. And the gels are degrading in response to reducing conditions. Um, so kind of thinking about how this could be then applied, um, there's some tissue engineering examples, but the one I have here is maybe a little bit more related to um, drug delivery. On the left, 
Um, stiffness might be important in drug delivery if you're thinking about having force actually induce the release of your drugs. Um, so if you have something very stiff, it might um, not compress as much for the deformation, which would then release the drug, or in the converse, when you're stretching it, um, depending on how stiff it is, uh, you might have a different release in terms of the molecules that are embedded inside of your hydrogel. Um, on the flip side, so if you're decoupling the stiffness and the degradation, um, since these are redox responsive, I think it's been well known that um, tumor cells themselves have a, a higher intracellular level of glutathione, so a reducing condition. Um, but some recent work also has shown that the extracellular matrix around um, some of those cells seem to be in a more reducing condition if they're going to be metastatic. And so I think this could be an example of having some sort of depot um, that could basically, based on how reducing of an environment your tumor is, right, that's correlated with metastasis, um, would then deliver some sort of molecule or drug. So that's my first example. Um, the second one kind of ties into this cartilage engineering. Um, so my student, Claire Kilmer, who's sitting in the audience as well, <laughs> um, she's been working a lot on developing protein-based scaffolds um, to improve uh, the repair of uh, cartilage that has degenerated due to osteoarthritis. Um, we've worked on these gels um, in cell culture, so in an incubator, but, and looked at how cells respond. But she's also um, done an animal study where she basically harvested the bone marrow for individual rabbits. So the model here would be the rabbits, the patient. So if you were the patient, you would harvest the bone marrow there. Um, cultured the cells and then expanded them and then embedded them inside of this gel that was then um, placed into the defect of the knees that we made into these rabbits. And I'm just showing some histological sections. I wasn't expecting most people to be familiar with histology. Um, but the idea here is that the first column, it says collagen call one slash two. That's our kind of improved hydrogel. And when you put it in the defect, the defect is marked by the arrowheads. Uh, the proteoglycans, which is indicative of cartilage matrix, shown in pink, you see a lot more of that forming um, compared to a control of just collagen 1, which is often used, um, or the empty defect where you don't fill it just to see what would happen, what does the animal do. Um, and so kind of thinking about the personalized aspects of this, um, certainly we're thinking right now of using autologous cells, so cells that you would gather from yourself, the patient. Um, and in this case, we actually preform the gel, but I think one of the things we're interested in going towards is maybe thinking about um, if you have this defect, do you want to do bioprinting for cartilage? Or maybe it's simple enough to just inject it, but it'll kind of conform to that patient defect. So there's a little bit of personalization rather than just buying some material that's prefabricated. Maybe the surgeon chops it a little bit, but here it's just trying to actually um, conform to the defect size. Those are my two examples. Thank you, Dr. Liu. And I should mention at this point also that although we didn't want to overly burden Dr. Anseth with another, asking her to prepare another presentation for the panel, of course, we'll welcome any comments or input um, that, that she has uh, along the way for sure. So the, the next uh, panelist to speak is Dr. Luis Solorio from the uh, Weldon School of Bio Biomedical Engineering Assistant Professor. He, his laboratory is very focused on cancer modalities, not only understa understanding the underlying pathophysiology, but also developing platforms, for instance, uh, that screen for uh, effective therapies. Uh, so, Dr. Solorio. Uh, thank you for having me. So, what I'll talk to you about today is this idea of cancer metastasis. And so, uh, when we think of cancer, I think we're all pretty well versed with this idea that it's it's pretty terrible disease and it affects lots of people very, very tragically. Uh, what what a lot of people aren't aware of is it's it's not actually the the primary tumor that tends to uh, be the cause of patient mortality, but it's actually the the metastasis that causes that. And so, what my lab really focused on is kind of trying to understand the steps in the met metastatic cascade and where we can use engineering technologies to uh, kind of 
identify and really find effective treatments to prevent this effect. Now, when we think about metastasis, classically, we think about uh, this population of cells that are growing roguely, right, completely out of control, and then they, they, they undergo some sort of stressor. This could be drugs, it could be the environment. Something is driving them to transition into a new state, and then uh, they, they leave the environment, go someplace else, and then seed, and then ideally they'll, they'll switch and they'll grow. And it's this process that we, we think of, this accumulation of mutations that starts to uh, uh, change how they respond to drugs. Well, it turns out that this classical pathway is, uh, is not really correct. It's, uh, it's kind of old. This is the old thought. This is, uh, and, and research by David Leiden's group, uh, Julio Aguirre-Guiso, uh, has really shown that it's actually much more complicated. So it's not just a single collection of, of primary tumor cells, but it's, it's really a, a whole physiological system that's working in concert, and, and it's these interactions that, that change things. And not only uh, do we have to think about this time course of events and that met metastasis is this end-stage uh, event, no, it actually happens before there's a palpable tumor. So they're actually early disseminated cells that will escape well before there's anything detectable. So you have metastasis that occurs throughout a person, potentially throughout a person's lifetime. They may not ever outgrow, but they, they could happen. And what we're seeing is that this uh, idea of organotropism or tissue specificity uh, develops uh, in response to this. So the, the cancer cells actually release things that create what we call a pre-metastatic niche. So this is a small little tissue space that's very hospitable to the cancer cells and allows for metastatic outgrowth. And so we, we kind of started to focus on this concept of what is this pre-metastatic niche? And so what we find is that if we look at a normal healthy lung, we see lower levels of fibronectin expression. But then uh, during early metastasis, we start to see this fibrillar network of fibronectin form. And it's this fibrillar network that actually, it's this fiber aspect that actually changes these uh, cells and it provides uh, an environment for cells to actually grow. And so what we wanted to do was develop a way to kind of mimic and recapitulate that aspect of the tumor space. And so we developed a platform that allows us to take fibronectin, which is just part of your blood plasma, and then uh, transition it from this globular, completely inactive state into fibrils that actually drive that and facilitate that metastatic outgrowth. And then using the system to create that sort of environment, what we were able to show was that if we take uh, cancer cells from a pleural effusion, so these are a buildup of lymphatic fluid in a patient's lung, it just happens, it's, it's, it's a course of metastasis, and it's very uncomfortable for, uncomfortable for the patient. It's this giant milieu of cells, no one really knows completely what's in it, it changes constantly. So we can take this solution, uh, and if we try and grow it on plastic, the cells die, they don't seed. Now, if we take this synthetic pre-metastatic niche, and then seed our cells on top of it, we have now selected for that inherent population of cells. And then what we find even more exciting is that we're actually able to enrich for the cancer cell population. And this gives us a snapshot into a, a patient-specific cancer. So during the time course of all their treatments, they're gonna have this fluid drain. And what we can do is we can sample this fluid, put it on our small little chip platform, and screen unbiasedly for thousands of compounds. And so that's kind of uh, where we're going with respect to the precision medicine aspect is using this uh, approach to really tailor uh, specifically to these cells that, that are constantly mutating and different from patient to patient. And so it gives us a real strategy. Uh, really, the idea is to give clinicians the tools to narrow down which drugs they potentially would want to give a patient uh, when they have thousands and thousands of compounds to choose from. And it just kind of helps to narrow down that selectivity so that hopefully we can actually improve the patient outcome. Thank you very much. Uh, the next uh, speaker is Dr. Andrew Brightman from uh, the Weldon School uh, of Biomedical uh, Engineering. And uh, he has, uh, Andrew has a very strong background in, uh, among other things, in engineering ethics and has led the effort uh, in the School of Biomedical Engineering to make sure that this perspective is incorporated into the curriculum. So he will even though precision medicine presents many fantastic opportunities, there also are some, um, a lot of issues that have to be raised from an ethical perspective, and Dr. Brightman will address some of those. Thank you very much. Um, yes, I, I think there's a number of aspects that we could look at. I chose to think about personalized bioprinting as one area to consider the ethics 
um, Dr. Anses work uh, making those materials that could potentially become bio inks and then printing, use bio printing into tissues or organs is a field that is an emerging technology and has a lot of potential in medicine. Um, I like that quote that bioprinting 3D organs could have the same revolutionary and democratizing effect as book printing in their applicability to regenerative medicine and industry, and I think particularly to per personalized medicine. Uh, there's two aspects that uh, I think are important to consider when you're looking at a bioethical perspective. One is the identification of what the ethical issues could be. And the second is then what do you do about them or how do you respond to them? And the, in the first aspect, uh, I take an approach uh, and encourage this among uh, our biomedical engineers uh, that's built from biomedical ethics using the four principles of biomedical ethics uh, promoted by uh, Beecham and Childress and uh, in their classic work on principles of biomedical ethics. We use that as a framework to identify issues. The second I want to consider briefly is just a, a framework of responsible research innovation. This idea that uh, two aspects of it, one that um, we, if we think about the biomedical ethical issues early in the design and innovation process, we can end up actually with better innovation at the end. And part of that thinking about those ethical issues is who gets involved and how to incorporate them. And I'll say a little bit right at the end. So if we use the four principles of biomedical ethics as a framework, they are beneficence, or to do as much good as possible, and non-maleficence, which is to do as little harm or no harm as possible. The other two on the next slide are justice and respect for autonomy. So I just uh, tried to identify a few uh, issues. Uh, most of these are from the published literature. You, you can probably think of others, but uh, that are around the beneficence of, or the good that can be done with bioprinting in a precision medicine framework. Certainly they are allowed to address very specific patient needs. You can bioprint an organ that could be very tailored to that unique individual. Uh, there'd certainly be a reduced need for organ donation if you can create these organs without having to sacrifice anyone else's organs. Uh, you would avoid xenotransplantation and all the issues that come from that, both cultural and, uh, um, and biological. There's a reduced need for immune suppression if you're using the patient's own cells and uh, uh, non-reactive uh, biomaterials. Certainly providing organs and tissues that could have an adaptability or a growth potential would be great for pediatric applications. Uh, creating better disease models for testing, whether it's new drugs or tissue engineered products and uh, certainly providing alternatives to animal testing would be considered a beneficence uh, issue. On the other side, uh, there's possible harms or risks of harms. There is risk of rejections if you're creating organs bioprinting with using some mixture of uh, animal cells in there. Uh, there's a possibility that you, you are running a higher risk of failure. These high complexity uh, bioprinted organs, if they're gonna be functional, uh, they're high complexity, so they're a lot harder to both develop and then to test. Certainly there's risks of unknown side effects, so longer animal testing and clinical trials might be necessary before they could get into a patient. Uh, limited irreversibility, once bioprinted organs are implanted, uh, they get incorporated, and then if you've done something wrong, they're in the body now. And how do you reverse that? Might be impossible. High cost of development and translation with any new emerging technologies, you have to consider the cost and the uh, opportunity costs, and that could be a potential harm. And certainly managing public expectations and hype around a potential emerging technology that might take 10 years before it's ever, or longer before it's realized. Um, on, the, on the justice side, which is the just distribution of healthcare and benefits uh, and, and risk of harm, uh, a few more issues, access to advanced technologies may be limited only to those who can afford them or to countries where the infrastructure to develop them and deliver those bioprinted organs. Uh, legal ownership of the tissues, who owns what's been printed? Um, do you own your own cells? Do the company that used them, the, the hospital that made the tissues for you? Uh, the rights to market them, what if we're designing uh, personalized tissues and then marketing them more broadly if they had broad applicability. 
who gets the, the right to market and the, ref and the funds from that. And certainly there's issues around personalized testing and how long and complicated that might be. And the respect for autonomy also comes in, this right to make decisions. So does the patient get to make decisions about how bioprinted organs made from their tissues are used? Um, do you ever have the right to grow your own tissues and then do what you want with them? Uh, and that possibility of you know, home printing is probably uh, quite a lot longer away than doing it commercially, but it's still a possibility. Creating enhanced organs is another issue that we have to think about. Uh, what if we want not just disease repair, but we want our muscles to have faster twitch or our organs to do specialized metabolism? Or do we have any rights or regulations to print anything that we want and implant it or use it? So the last piece is just a framework. So if we have these issues, how do we respond to them? How do we begin to specify how uh, risky they are or how uh, detrimental they might be? Um, and who gets involved in that decision and then how do we regulate that? And so the Responsible Research Innovation Framework suggests that more than just the technologists, the engineers, and the clinicians who are involved in this technology, uh, you need a public opinion. Uh, you need uh, social scientists, you need ethicists to be involved in the early stages of this kind of innovation to collectively assess the risks, and mitigate and manage them, and be in charge of the overall uh, regulation. Thank you very much. And the last presentation is uh, by Dr. Michael Hiles from Cook Biotech, Senior Vice President and Chief Scientific Officer there, also an adjunct professor in both uh, Weldon School of Biomedical Engineering and the College of Veterinary Medicine, has a very strong uh, history and relationship with Purdue, having gotten both electrical engineering and veterinary medicine degrees, and he's been instrumental in that program for, for a number of years. Uh, and finally, from an industry uh, side, and that's the perspective he's going to provide today, is has over 30 years experience in, in uh, the field that we're, we're discussing. So, Dr. Hiles. Thank you for that kind introduction and, and for having me. This is fun. I should say, uh, perhaps now for something completely different, because I didn't have a lot of pretty pictures or really focused on research. Instead, I was asked to talk about what is it that might be the obstacles or the opportunities to commercializing this stuff. So I put together a couple of slides, just two, about those. And uh, so here's a couple of points. These processes always lag, are, are, all kinds of new research processes always lag behind uh, the technology that actually gets commercialized. So there's always a lag time. And often a preponderance of safety has to be first established uh, no current paradigms, uh, paradigms allow for uh, all outputs of a given process. And what I meant by that is, is that over the years, we've gotten more and more in vitro diagnostics to the point that the division of uh, devices within the FDA has a whole special sub-branch on in vitro diagnostics. And I think what we're finding is, is that as we're starting to get more and more, I'll call it ex vivo personal process development or, or uh, personal production, that we might need a whole new regulatory framework to regulate these things. In other words, if you could get a product by process, that's a, that's a, a terminology that a lot of patent lawyers use, but a product by process and you get an approval for every product that comes out of that process, if you can keep it within certain parameters, then that might be a regulatory framework that would work for these. But, but currently the regulatory climate is not mature enough to determine whether these things are devices, drugs, or something else. And that's why I think maybe there's an opportunity for a whole new framework because uh, many of the examples that you've seen today, both here at, the, at this part and, and at the original lecture, as soon as you start adding something that has a biological function that starts to alter cell behavior, it's a drug. And to give you an idea, at least in the FDA and in the world that we live in, a drug takes somewhere north of 10 years and a billion dollars from start to finish, whereas an average device, you know, typically maybe five years and five million dollars. Big difference. And so if you're just a scaffold without any bioactivity, you're a device, at least right now. But as soon as you start tailoring all these things, what is it? So we need to think about maybe that product by process type of regulatory that might be new but effective. And then I just threw in some commercialization questions. Is the manufacturer uh, of end products now subsumed by supplies, tools, and software? So if you think about it, if you could bioprint right next to the operating room anything that the patient needs, then there's no reason for manufacturing 
the thing that the patient needs. You're not manufacturing the endpoint, you're simply manufacturing the device to build it and the supplies, the inks that it uses and the software that it runs on. So you've changed the whole paradigm of what manufacturing is. How strict limits will be placed on each component in each process so nothing harmful can be created. So that gets, this gets back to the product by process and if there's any way to tune it so that uh, you can't uh, make, or you can make something toxic or something dangerous, then you want to uh, inhibit that. Uh, I have to tell you a quick antidote, and that is that uh, we were at a medical advisory board meeting one time. We had a group of doctors there, and we were talking about a particular device that we were working on, and the doctor got up there and said, and, and, and no offense to you, but he said, you've got to make this device idiot-proof, because at the medical schools, we'll just build a better idiot. Finally, what tolerances and patient data will cause inappropriate outputs or contraindications for treatment? So that's the other thing, which is, if we're gonna do this whole personalized medicine and use patients' own data to then tailor the device, you know, what, what parts of that data can be used and what parts can't be used and what parts might make the device non-functional or functional. So just some ideas, because at, at Cook Biotech, we spend a lot of time looking at technologies and what we call a, a technology readiness level, which is, goes across a lot of industries, but how close is it to commercialization? Is it, is it years away? Is it months away? Is it, it decades away? So. Thanks uh, very much to all the panelists. And before we open it up for questions and discussion, uh, I'll just check in with Dr. Ansis and see if, if you have any quick comments or views, uh, again, before we open it up more broadly. Um. Well, I, mean, I think the points were very well raised, and you know, I think it's a challenge for us also to figure out is what is most impactful for us to be doing in this space as well. Um, as we go towards more precision and personalization, um, we see all the advances in cancer immunotherapy. So we work with your T cells, and there's CAR T cell therapy. One patient, one treatment is you know, $500,000. Mm -hmm versus should we be thinking globally and what impact can we do to better understand how different subsets of patients with lower technology can be treated? And, you know, there's no right answer there, but I think it's a, a challenge to think about as well. Okay, well, thank you again, and uh, we'll open it up for uh, a broad discussion. Any pointed questions to any of the panelists' presentations or your comments? Uh, a good moderator always has some questions in his back pocket in case the, <laughs> they're, they're slow to come, so I've, I've got a couple. Um, so we, we kind of touched upon the, the how do you clinically validate these, these types of, of new products because as we talked, to, talked about for drugs, you mentioned, Dr. Hiles, that it's at least a 10-year process and the phase three clinical trial could be 400, 500 million dollars to, to, to look at two or 3,000 patients. So again, that's a heterogeneous group of, of patients, that the, but then the drug or the technology is only used in a given patient. So looking forward, I don't think that that paradigm is going to change, but what additional clinical validation is going to be required for, these, for, for some of these uh, newer approaches to satisfy the FDA and other regulatory bodies? Well, I'll give a stab at that, but it, it's, it's a great question because regulations seem to be getting tighter, not looser. And uh, the concept of uh, personalizing something, I think maybe has to start with all of the components being already approved so that you at least have a, a basis on which of safety to build and then say, okay, we're going to take these already approved products and mix them in various ways and then you know, as I suggested, maybe through a possible new regulatory pathway or some uh, particular pilot program that they might put together specifically for personalized medicine. And, well, and I, I think we saw one of the examples as well. Um, you know, I, I think we need to find ways to fail earlier. I think personalized approaches that allow more sophisticated in vitro assays are, are important. Um, but I also think on the, the flip side too, there was a New York Times article about how um, personalized and precision medicine was failing the average 
patient or person because it wasn't really benefiting them. So, you know, the average response and the average treatment can actually be harmful to many, many people. So how do we navigate that, that space? Um, I have one colleague, just as one example, you know, a woman is not a small man is the talk she gives. Yet we dose drugs based upon weights, you know. And, and so I think there's, it's at some level, the economies of what, what subsets can we look at and the markets can bear financial development for, for different subpopulations is, is a really important thing. And I think engineers have to play a role in that. Well, I think one thing we're starting to do now, though, is that we, because we're collecting so much data on patients, that if there's a particular uh, ailment, like they have a hernia and they need a hernia repair, and there's a dozen different types of uh, devices that m they might use, they can go back and look at the patient, and there might be some reason why they might be contraindicated for a particular therapy. So now it's not just the physician deciding that, oh, I like this product better, so I'll use it in everybody. They are starting to look at the demographic of the patient and tailor the solution, if it's already on the market, to the patient, but it's not being made next door. So. I, I would also say that um, cl while clinical trials were designed for testing both safety and efficacy, uh, protecting the patient, safety is a high uh, value. Uh, we, we do, as the emerging technology, need to think about new paradigms for clinical testing. And part of that, it, our engineers coming and clinicians as well working together to come up with these new forms of testing. We, we really need a testing science, a, a revised testing science for clinical testing. When it's a personalized medicine, or otherwise we're going to have safety issues all the way down the road because you, you can't generalize those kinds of technologies. Dr. Amkirsten. Oh, oh. Hang on, involved. Oh, thank you. Curious about uh, to what extent does FDA get involved in uh, using personalized strategies. Uh, for example, let's say uh, you base it on mathematical modeling and point out to the clinician that uh, each individual patient, there is a way to learn about the patient's uh, special response to a given drug. And if you were to come up with strategies for dosage, will you could take the attitude maybe that could be used as a suggestion to the clinician and it would be up to the uh, clinician's uh, discretion as to whether to use it or not? Or would the FDA get involved that even the clinician can't use it until we approve it? Who wants to take that? Right? Yeah. <laughs> it's, a good, it, it's a good question, and I think it, it's a hard question. But first of all, physicians can't prescribe anything that hasn't been approved already, with very few exceptions. There are some uh, emergency uses and things like that, but very few exceptions. But the FDA also very carefully says, we do not regulate the practice of medicine. And what they say by that is, is that we will not stand between the doctor and the patient. And so if the doctor prescribes a drug that is supposed to have this regimen, and instead he prescribes that regimen, that's between him and the patient, it's, the FDA doesn't step in. But the drug couldn't have been there, at least it, unless it was approved for a particular thing, which gets to a whole other discussion about uh, off-label use of medical products, whether it's drugs or devices. And a lot of people want to outlay law off-label use, but if that's true, then for diabetics and for, uh, and for pediatrics or children or whatever, a lot of things would go away because none of them were made for that in the first place. And I can follow up with that on, yeah. on some level because when uh, a clinician so say a patient uh, is prescribed with a, a HER2 positive cancer and they want to get, uh, uh, they want to give them the Herceptin, the, the drug to treat it based off of the receptor status, and it fails. Well, once that standard of care therapy fails, the clinician has, you know, they're, they're kind of going blind at that point. And so a lot of the times already they have to rely on just their past experiences to guide and dictate what that patient has. And there's no evidence to, to it's not evidence-based. And so I, I think with, respect to the FDA approval, it's, it, I mean, the, the standard would already be there and we'll let the doctors u use the information as they see fit. And I think that would probably be a wise strategy. And maybe just to add a, a slightly different point too is, um, 
that as we have more data in, in certain areas of medicine, um, modeling, artificial intelligence, machine learning can sometimes detect things better than the doctor for the treatment. You know, for, for example, certain um, uh, macular degeneration, and, and, it, and it's been shown. But as a regulatory aspect, we have tort law in our country as well. And even though some of this technology exists, most medical practices are not yet willing to trust the outcome of a image diagnosis over the face-to-face -face of what a doctor recommends to a patient. So kind of echoing these doctor-patient kind of relations. So we aren't there yet. So it's, it's interesting. I have a question about privacy. Um, so currently when we collect data about patients' bioinformatics, we have ways to anonymize the data if it's just bits and bytes, right? If we start harvesting tissue from patients in order to regenerate organs for them and they consent to donate the residual tissue to the company for further research, are there any ways for us to anonymize tissue so that the company can keep working with it without any sort of privacy concerns from the patient? There are, and, and biobanking ethics deals with this quite often. We already collect a lot of tissues and samples. What I think you're getting at, which is even highlighted in personalized medicine, is we're, when that tissue is donated, a lot of screening's gonna be done that will point to that as a unique piece of tissue. That data will be stored and protected. Um, lots of other information may be collected about that particular patient, their background and, and other aspects, genetics. And as that tissue and that data is being used, particularly if there's modeling going on or other kinds of databases are involved or that data needs to be shared with other kinds of researchers or even clinicians, we run into the potential for de-identifying a particular patient because those algorithms, uh, even if they're encrypted or as you're sharing them, there's more opportunities for those to be um, matched or mapped back to the original patient. So we have to have uh, processes to pr that are heightened in terms of po policies of protection for the patients. I think that's also another interesting point. Um, so also what what is patient data? And um, you know, I, I think in a medical context, we have all kinds of protections and rules and regulation. Um, but now a lot of this technology even just gets out into the general public going directly towards um, getting their genome sequence themselves and loading it up to ancestry.com. It's public data and it's available, and, and how is that used? I think Apple and our phones and the watches we wear can collect data on our health, and um, that can be a very good thing. It can lead to interventions or monitoring, but that data is not subjected to this same type of privacy issues, and I think a lot of people don't know that. And so it's, it's an interesting time with not just how can we lead to improvements in medical care, but what are implications um, health insurance, you know, um, life insurance. Uh, so there's, there's both sides to it, which I think you raised uh, as well. I just wanted to add, um, I'm sure many of you who work with cells have heard of HeLa cells, and there's a very famous, um, well, there's a book that's been published in the last five years talking about Henrietta Lacks, right? So she was the donor, and I think we also have to be cognizant about she didn't really realize what kinds of purposes her cells would be put to. And I think a lot of her um, children were actually quite upset to know that there were pieces of her living out there. And I think part of your question, yes, we have to de-anonymize, or how do we do that when we have so much specific information? But how do we also educate the person so they really understand what's going to be done with that tissue? And what kind of information will people know about them? 
I would also say bioethicists are struggling with this idea of what does privacy mean in both in the medical and res human research because we've come into a, an era, it seems, where it's not a, a, a binary. It's not either private or public. There are grades of what privacy is, which means our policies need to reflect that shift in our current status of how much we're willing to give up and for what value or return. But understanding the, the uses of what that data is going to be critical to that gradation of what privacy means. Uh, since we have representatives, are, was there a question? Another question? No. Um, since we have representatives from uh, academics and industry here, maybe I'll, I'll float a question to everybody. Does, generally speaking, the, the, the field of pr precision medicine, does it offer a lot of opportunity in terms of uh, industry academic collaboration? Or what, what's your feeling about, about the future, especially given the pharmaceutical industry's apparent uh, kind of latching on to it? I can, I can start. So my, my personal feel uh, interacting with other companies is, is a sense of uh, ca cautious optimism. And that, you know, we've gone down these roads before thinking, you know, this is going to be the next big thing. And then a lot of money has been invested in it and it's kind of fizzled out. And, and I think, you know, there's a definitely excitement, and, but there's also, let's see what you can do from a research side and, and let's see how realistic, a little bit more, I think, uh, from industry perspectives, it seems that they're a little bit more cautious than they might have been, you know, 20 years ago if, if we would have been at the same state. Just because there have been failures in the past to really advance things at the rate that, you know, were, were promised from academia. I think there's a great amount of opportunity. I mean, I, I don't know whether you have to basically narrow it and narrow it and narrow it and say as a company, we're gonna come talk to these researchers about a very particular disease and a very particular disease state and a very particular population. Maybe that's where it'll start, but I think there's a lot of opportunity. Uh, any other questions or, or is there another? Qu okay, yes, a question from the audience. Back to the topic on FDA approvals um, for particular devices. So, as we know, on the topic of off-label use, it can be a physician's discretion to try to treat these patients when there are no other solutions. And if enough data presents itself, that can be published in case studies, and what was once off-label can become on-label through FDA approvals. So my question is, can personalized medicine keep pace with some of these innovative discoveries that are found somewhat organically? Or are we risking um, a, an opportunity where innovation may be stifled in ways that are yet unknown? Um, how do we encourage those types of innovation, innovations through academics um, to be sure that we're not missing out on opportunities to treat a variety of disease states that the uh, original intent may not have been there. Any takers? <laughs> well, my, my first thought is better and better modeling. If we can prove that models are validatable so that we can actually guess in silico or whatever that this is really going to work and those models get better and better, then we might be able to improve that uh, in, in that way. It is, I mean, to your point, it's, it seems like a little bit different situation, though, for instance, off-label use of a device or a drug is typically just, as, as you know, is just taking that technology and, and using it in a patient population that it wasn't, that not indicated for based on the regulatory process. But here, I think we're talking about maybe even if they involve kind of off-the-shelf uh, cleared or approved products, it still is almost by, by definition, kind of mixing things together to form a package, whether it's a diagnostic with a drug or a sensor with a medical device or, or whatever. So it's, it's maybe a little bit different pathway, and maybe that's what makes it a little more complicated. Yeah, I mean, I've, I think the pessimists, so I've been in, in, in some discussions where people think the pace of innovation is slowing because of our... our some of our regulations and systems and what we focus on. Um, but I think there's many reasons to be optimistic as well. Um, 
you know, unfortunately, you might know the statistics better, but medical devices and some of their approval, you know, I think 80 to 90 percent get approved through what's called a 510K, where it's based upon something that exists, and, and you want to make what you're doing sound as close to something that's already a product, and in some ways that suppresses or hides some, some of the innovation in, in what's going forward. And, I think there's movement afield right now of what's going to happen maybe in the future with some of medical devices. Um, but you know, I think also when you think globally, I think there's also a huge opportunity for innovation. And, and what we know now is based really even a lot on smaller subpopulations, European and US, and I think there are different populations and groups in, in, in Africa where there can be lots of tremendous innovation applied in different ways depending on how you define it. Yeah. Yeah, I think a risk averse society as well as cost containment and healthcare both work against the innovation. I'm not saying it's killing it. It's not an indictment of, of anything other than it just makes more challenges because uh, something new that you've got to bring, you've got to uh, bring to the table and realize that it may not, it's not going to be perfect. So it, this gets me at least sometimes back into this better modeling approach. And I think you raise an issue of, uh, uh, where in the, just very recently the FDA paying more attention to real world data from uh, use, whether it's off label or other, uh, in the ability to approve. I think it opens a possibility if people want to do modeling and they want to look at that real world data and go back and say, oh, maybe this is only working for this subpopulation or maybe this works best in this population. We might be able to get some innovations out of that real world data that would inform how the research progresses. Another question here, whether it's actually germane to this discussion or not. It's an expression of frustration that comes about from the difference between the culture of physicians and engineers. One of the issues with modeling that has been hard to get across to physicians is the fact that equations can, are based, or the Model equations are based on some view of what's actually happening. And individuals are represented by the parameters that are in there. And it's been very hard to get that point across to physicians, that you can write the same equation and be able to describe the response to a drug of two entirely different people, different patients in the sense that perhaps some of the processes that are occurring in one patient are a little bit different quantitatively, quantitatively speaking. This is an issue that has not been easy to get across to physicians. I don't know what others feel about this, but I've tried to get across, for example, the idea that water and air are two very different fluids. They're both Newtonian, as long as you don't worry about compressibility. <laughs> Viscosity and density are the two things that you use. The equations are the same, but there's nothing similar about water and air. This is an issue that I dearly want to get across to physicians. And, and Mike, you, it goes back to your point of better modeling and, and yeah. Well, at the risk of sounding Rumsfeld-esque, there's the known knowns, the unknown unknowns, and, and everything in between. And, and I think it's hard to convince the doctors that your model is good when they have patients that are sitting in front of them that they could easily enumerate, you know, 150 different variables. And did you take all those into account or not? Or did you decide that most of them were irrelevant? And so... Uh, it becomes, a, at least in, I think in a physician's mind, it becomes a very complex process that, that can be simplified if you're an engineer and take through, it can be simplified, but communicating that is, is hard. You're the only physician. Come on. I, my specialty is very quantitative, nephrology is. Uh, <laughs> but but uh, I would say, in fairness, most physicians are, are relatively non-quantitative. I, 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 would, I would agree. And they balk at the idea of being able to reduce 
a complex uh, human down into elements that can be modeled. I, I, would, I would say that's a, a, a very general statement, but nevertheless probably pretty accurate. I, mean, I would maybe say two things, right? So we are seeing examples of medical schools now starting that are, have an engineering-centric curriculum. So I, I think that will be interesting to see what that generation of physicians and how they think. Um, and I do think you call to a point that right now we're in an era of quantitating and measuring lots and lots of things, right? So the whole genome, the whole proteomics, and the approach has largely been to try to understand every single aspect of the changes that are occurring. But what I, where I think what you mentioned and what modeling and engineering brings to the table is we understand a system, we reduce complexity, we understand governing principles. And somehow I think we've got to play a role in that, that how simple becomes complex enough to model or provide guidance to, to treat a, a patient or a person. Oh, one other thing. Uh, I'm not sure how, if I can uh, elaborate the, uh, or you know, state this properly, but basically, uh, if you're treating a patient and you can find the parameters of a particular variable that you're trying to tweak that don't cause harm, so you've got this range in which you're pretty sure you're not going to cause any harm, but yet you have uh, no effect. There are a lot of people out there that say that if you administer a, a therapy and it has no effect, that that's harm because you've uh, set up an expectation that you didn't meet. So that makes uh, the definition of harm even fuzzy at times. So. I think we're kind of winding down time-wise, so uh, if there aren't any more questions or comments from the audience, I'd like to say thank you very much to the panelists and, and thanks once again to Dr. Anseth for her stellar presentation and participating in the panel, and thanks for joining us. Thank you.